Hi, Jesus. Thank you for today. Um, I pray that everything that I wrote um, gives others revelation or even just food for thought, as my lovely mother called it. Uh, we thank you for today and we thank you for your word in your name. Um, it should be noted that I was going to wear a shirt uh, with a UFO on it that said the end is near because I thought it'd be really funny. Um, however, uh, Brendan told me it was not professional, so I did not order it. Um, my paper I called um, The End is Not Nigh. Um, I love to poke fun at people that say that the end is nigh with their little, you know, picketing sticks. Um, I will say that writing this was easily the most difficult thing I've done so far. I don't know if the rest of you feel that way, like especially since every year we've had to do something, but this one was just, uh, it was a challenge to say the least. I am an opinionated person. I'm an Enneagram eight. So that means that I'm aggressive with my opinions. So this was really good. Um, it brought me a lot of clarity on a lot of things. And um, yeah, it was just, it was just good. So um, basically what I focused my uh, thesis on was comparing Jesus's teachings in Matthew, um, specifically Matthew, because you know Mark and Luke are pretty much the same, but comparing Matthew 24 and 25 with um, the book of Revelation. Um, my bachelor year, uh, which was two years ago, that's weird. Um, I was really nervous because I chose the book of Revelation and I didn't want to talk about those opinions. I was like, I don't want people to know what I believe. I just want to go through my life without ever having an opinion about it. And so I wrote about like the doxologies in it, which was neat, but I knew <laughs> Uh, God is a jokester with me. And so he knows that if I don't want to deal with something, he's going to make it come back around and bite me in the butt. So this was that moment. Um, so honestly, the, the biggest reason why I wanted to write about this is because especially right now, we're seeing a lot of people claiming that this is the mark or Jesus is going to return tomorrow because everything is just so bad. And um, number one, uh, it's not that bad. It's going to get worse for sure. But if Jesus came tomorrow, I would not have a problem with that. Um, so it's just really, it was really on my heart. I'm tired of the fear. I'm tired of the fear mongering. I'm tired of media and people who um, really truly believe that these things are biblical and that these feelings are biblical. Um, I'm tired of that being a thing. And I, I, I would like it to end. So my paper is basically me giving food for thought, looking at the language. I know you guys are shocked, but looking at the Greek and the Hebrew and seeing what these words actually meant because so much of what we believe, especially with end times, is all up for interpretation and um, mistranslation. You know, we have a million different Bibles. They all mean different things. So um, there were basically um, four different subjects that I kind of went into according to what Jesus taught. First one was end of the age. Um, second one was uh, his return. Um, I did the idea of judgment. And then I also talked about new heavens and new earth because I know nothing about that. So that was really fun. Um, it's important to know that when Jesus says end of the age, you know, like when is the end of the age coming? Well, you know, these things have to happen. Age can mean a lot of different things. And so for the sake of me talking right now, we're going to just assume that it means the end of the end age. We, we're not going to assume that it means 10 years, a thousand years tomorrow. We're going to just assume it's just the end of the end. Um, something really important, I think, um, just to kind of give a baseline of where I'm at with everything is that in Luke, um, when Jesus read from the book of Isaiah, I think it was um, chapter four, I think. Um, he rolled up the scroll before he, before Isaiah talked about the day of vengeance. And I think it's really important that we realize that because Jesus didn't want that fear in those people, it means that he also doesn't want that fear in us. Um, the day of vengeance was something um, that was kind of termed as like a concept of chaos. And so Jesus didn't want to put that chaos in these people. What's the point? He didn't come to create chaos. 
at this moment. So um, just something to think about. Um, with the end of the age, like I said, age can mean a million different things. I think it's really important to think about if the end is coming, we have to understand God's intent for the end wanting to come. And we have to understand what it should look like in the world that God would say it's time. I think that's really important. If we're going to understand the, the, the idea of all of this, we have to understand kind of from God's perspective, what he would probably theoretically like to say, I'm not saying I know God's brain. I do not know God's brain, but theoretically kind of what he would want. Um, if you think about Genesis, our original intent for humanity was to be with God in Eden, living this, this loving communion relationship with him. Um, but we got kicked out, which led to us having to deal with death and sin and um, the entire intent of the end times, any end times theology is to get back to what it was originally meant to be. Um, really, really important. Uh, so when the disciples asked him, when will the age, the end of the age come? He said, um, three major things had to happen. There had to be false gods that came to the forefront. There had to be wars and famines and earthquakes. And number three, the gospel had to be preached throughout the entire world. And then only after that would the end come. Um, all three represent something within humanity that we need to solve. We need to work through ourselves. Um, things like self-glorification, hatred of others, a lack of patience. Um, that's really important. There's kind of two different people on the spectrum of end times. Either you think it's all um, BS for a lack of better term, or you think that it's the most important thing on the planet. We need to find a middle ground because obviously we need to care, but it's not the most important thing. It's going to come when it comes. So um, talking about false gods, of course, I'm going to talk about the Antichrist, um, that's kind of the main like false God that happens. Um, I have a lot of feelings about this personally, but um, from all of my language studies, I'm, <laughs> I'm like 95% convinced, I'm still leaving room for growth, of course. But uh, you'll see in uh, the letters of first and second John, that uh, it says, uh, John writes, some of the lines of like, um, it's the last hour and you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Um, it's important, first off, to look at the word. Uh, Antichrist means anyone that's quite literally anti-Christ. It was never meant to have a the in front of it. It was never meant to have an article that said the Antichrist. Doesn't mean that, you know, a specific person won't come forth, but that's up for interpretation. Um, the Greek word antichristos, I'm going to say all these words wrong, <laughs> just so sorry, but um, it means the adversary of the Messiah, um, which is actually given um, a, a title um, Peter gave to the devil, meaning, I think the verse had something to do with, um, uh, he called him an adversary because he came like a roaring lion seeking to devour, which I thought was really interesting. Um, Second Thessalonians, there's very few places where Antichrist is actually mentioned, um, but there's like three or four kind of major spots. In Second Thessalonians, Paul writes um, that the Antichrist is the man of sin, the son of perdition, uh, who will come to deceive. Um, the word for man used, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the word for man um, is anthropos, um, which actually can be a singular man or plural man. And when you look at the usages in the Bible for every time this word is used, more than not, like it's a pretty big divide, more than not, it is a plural sense. Jesus taught it and used it in a plural sense. He was never pointing at one person and saying, you, you know, he was saying all of you. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, so again, I kind of feel I'm, I'm under the impression that we've already seen a million false gods already since Jesus came, right? It's just a thing. It's going to continue. It's going to probably expand quite a bit, um, but it is what it is. 
it's a spirit of self-glorification. It's the, the spirit in itself is very anti-Christ because if we're glorifying only ourselves, we're not glorifying God. And that's the whole concept of um, an antichrist. The one that Jesus talked about was the abomination of desolation, which is really interesting. Um, he wasn't like when you, when you read through it, he wasn't talking about a specific person, but more or less kind of a movement. Um, the words for abomination of desolation, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce them because they're just a lot of vowels, but it means a foul thing of idolatry that will lead you to a desolate emptiness. Like how crazy is that? When you believe in a false God, you have this foul thing that's an idol and it's going to lead you to nothing but emptiness. So what Jesus was saying in Matthew 24 in regards to abomination and desolation, he's saying, if you believe in a false God, you're never going to be filled. There's only one person that can fill you and it's me. So that's really, really, really important. Um, in Revelation, to tie it into Revelation, uh, chapter 19 talks about uh, the false prophet uh, being uh, taken with the beast into the pit of fire. The false prophet um, is a singular word that's used, pseudo prophetess, I think. Um, but again, it's more of a, a spirit or a way of being um, in a couple of chapters before Revelation 19. Uh, John writes um, the idea of um, they are the spirits of devils. So again, Satan, it is important to note, Satan is not the false prophet. Satan is not the false God. Two completely different things to dive into another time, but it's really important to remember that they're two different things, two different meanings, and uh, they both get destroyed. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> they both have a really unfortunate ending, but great for us. Um, the second thing that will happen after false gods is earthly signs, tribulation. Earthly signs, obviously, um, earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes. Uh, something that I thought was really interesting was um, Jesus said in Matthew 24 that all of these things, earthquakes, famines, all of that, will be but the beginning of birth pains. And I thought that was really interesting that he used that uh, because if you remember in the beginning of Genesis when Eve and Adam uh, got kicked out uh, God gave them a big old kick in the butt and a major, um, you know, talk down. And he told her that um, Eve would be, uh, her and her descendants would have the pain of childbearing. And there would be a constant battle between woman and man in marriage. That was like the one thing. Um, Jesus said this because he wanted to emphasize the idea that birth pains would usher in a new age of life after Eden. And just like that, he would usher in a new age of life prior to a new Eden, which is new heavens and new earth that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, along with early signs is tribulation. Um, tribulation is not the same as punishment, nor is it wrath. Tribulation is meant to allow us to grow. We can't grow unless we're under pressure. It's kind of like I, I kept thinking about when you have a sidewalk and there's flowers they always manage to grow. And it's because of that pressure underneath the earth that they're able to escape. Well, that's a bad way of wording it, but you know, they escape to the surface to eat some sunlight. So um, tribulation is nothing to be scared of. We will always go through tribulation, but this is gonna be um, substantially more intense. So prepare yourselves. Um, the third thing that has to happen before the end of the age comes would be that the gospel has to be preached. This is a really difficult concept because if you think about it, if the gospel is being preached everywhere, why would God want to end the earth? If everyone believes in Jesus and everyone wants to do this, why would God end the earth? Um, he wants to end it because the earth is still full of not great things. You know, we don't want lions eating each other. We don't want to have the fear of being attacked by a bear. It's kind of like, I don't know if you guys uh, read the Chronicles of Narnia, The Last Battle, but it talks a lot about how, you know, the talking animals and the not talking animals and how they all at the end get to be what they're meant to be. And it's kind of like that, you know, we need to live in a, a safe world, a safe haven, a safe Eden. Uh, so it's, it's important to remember that even though it might sound like a really good thing, these things will kind of explode at the end. 
Um, something that Nancy actually uh, brought up to me was in Revelation, uh, there is an angel that proclaims an eternal gospel. And that is so cool because that shows that God, he, he wants us to have the desire to evangelize, to disciple people, to spread his love, but he knows that we won't be able to do it alone. And so he sends an angel to proclaim this gospel. He's, he's quite literally, you know, crossing his T's and dotting his I's. He's making sure that every single person has the opportunity. Um, so this idea of having to preach the gospel frantically, we need to have an urgency, but we're not alone. Like it, it's going to be okay. So if you, if you can't evangelize to your neighbor, God's going to send someone to do it. So it's all going to be good. Um, something to remember too, with, you know, God being with us through this process is that, you know, Jesus preached that he would leave the 99 for the one. It's the same idea with the angel proclaiming the gospel. He's not going to leave us to perish. He's going to find a way. So that's super important. Um, the second portion after the end of the age happens, um, he returns. Jesus returns. That's so exciting. Um, there's a couple things here. One of the major things is that it says that he's coming with the clouds. There's a million things that this could mean. Jesus could quite literally be riding a cloud shaped like a horse. I don't know. He could be floating down. He could also be in a thick presence. You know, the, the Shekinah is what Nancy always refers to it as, the, the presence of God. Or it could mean the coming of the judgment of God. Dun, dun, dun. Super scary, but not scary. Um, in the book of Daniel, uh, there's a portion that talks about um, someone coming on the clouds. It's a whole prophecy, um, but it, it's referring to a judgment coming. And the title of the verse is actually, or the chapter is actually called Son of Man is Given Dominion. <laughs> Goosebumps every time. Um, regardless of what it actually means, it's going to be really cool. It's going to be, it's going to make us speechless. I mean, just think about it. Jesus could come down right now and he'd be doing whatever he's doing. We won't, we won't have time to argue like, oh, see, I told you he's coming on the physical clouds. It's not Shekinah. We're not going to have time. It's not even going to matter. What matters though, is that it represents what's going to be happening. It represents who he is, where he's coming from and what he's about to do. So that's super, super important. Now, the rapture. Let us talk about the rapture. The rapture is mentioned probably three times in the whole Bible. It's not even, that's not even the word that's used. Um, but the idea is, it's valid. I'll admit I'm wrong. The idea is valid. I can, I can admit when I've been wrong. See, I can do it. Um, so in Matthew 24, Jesus says that angels will gather his elect. Um, the word elect means um, those picked out and chosen by God. First Thessalonians says that uh, the dead will rise first, followed by those who are left, and they'll be caught up in the clouds. Caught up means to be seized or plucked. Okay. First Corinthians, Paul says that we will be raised imperishable and will be changed. Raised imperishable means to be awakened from death to a non-immortal um, or non-corruptible immortal um, body or being. And the word changed actually means to exchange one thing for another and for that thing to cease. And so the big point of the rapture, and we're not going to be sucked up by UFO beams into a mothership, we're going to be changed. That's the thing that matters. It doesn't matter if it's a, a mental or a, a physical change. What matters is it's a spiritual change. It's this thing that's going to happen within us that is a, is a transformation of who we're meant to be, of a better us. And that if there's anything that you pick out of what I'm saying, it's that. It doesn't have to be, you know, this you know, left behind movie kind of a situation. It's just something that's going to be very peaceful and something that just happens. Kind of like, I, I kind of picture it like, you know, when Jesus was uh, transfigured, it just happened. It was peaceful. It was amazing. And it was just this feeling of like, I get it now. So 
it's important to know that the order of things that happen, it, they're all over. There's really no order. It could be any order first, really. Um, but something that will co either coincide or come after or before is the fact that Jesus will reign for a thousand years. Now, I love this part, okay? Because every church I've been to, every pretty much every sermon I've ever heard only talks about, you know, the, the kind Messiah who died for our sins. But Jesus, oh my gosh, guys, Jesus is this king who will kill death itself for his war-torn people. He is this absolute crazy person who is a horse riding, judgment giving, you know, fire eyed Messiah who has like a robe of blood, which is disgusting, but he does. And he has a sword for a tongue and a huge thigh tattoo that says, you know, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> like, just picture it for a second. That's like, that's my God. That's him right there, right? It's a, it's a God that has come to not mess around. He's here to not settle for less. And he even said in the gospels that he did not come to bring peace. He came to bring a sword. And that was what he was talking about. Um, during this time of crazy king warrior Jesus, um, a lot of things happen, death dies, you know, or I guess not death, uh, pardon me, the false prophet gets thrown to the fire, the beast gets thrown to the fire, Satan gets captured, you know, all this good stuff. Something though, the millennium, right? A thousand years. We have to think about, is it an actual thousand years? Is it a thousand years in God years? Every time I say that, I think dog years and it just makes me laugh. But is it a thousand years in God years? Like, what is that? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter because it still signifies that something's going to happen in that period of time, whether how short or how long, that is different um, in God's economy. It's gonna be different in the earth and in heaven. Something's going to happen. It's gonna be a light switch. And um, it's going to be cool if, you know, you're a believer. If you're not, it's going to suck really bad. So, um, you know, try not to rebel too much. Um, the important thing is that we'll be living with Jesus. It's not this thing where Jesus is, you know, the king and we're reigning. We get to reign with him. Um, and that's, that's something to kind of ponder is that we, this idea that we get to hang out with Jesus. It's so crazy. Um, it also says to be ready a million times, a million times in the Bible. It doesn't just mean, you know, prepare, have urgency. It means be ready. It could happen at any moment. It could happen when you're getting your car washed. You know, it could happen whenever. Um, judgment. Let's get to judgment. Judgment is not something to be scared of. Nancy put this little thing in my head, like, should you be scared of judgment? And I never really thought about it before. And I think it's really important, especially the degree that we're getting, that we understand that judgment is not something to be feared at all. It's something that we should look forward to. Judgment is not wrath. Period. Amen. It is not wrath. You think about what happened with Moses um, and, you know, the Hebrews and the, the Egyptians. When God told them, when God told Moses that he was going to bring judgment to his enemies, right? He didn't mean judgment on the Hebrews. He meant judgment on the Egyptians. Now, did the Hebrews have to deal with a bunch of stuff because the Egyptians were mad that God was punishing them? Yes. But that doesn't mean that God's judgment and wrath was on them. God's judgment was for Egypt alone. Period. Amen. Not for the Hebrews. That would come later. But it's important to understand that it's not wrath, especially if you believe in him. Judgment is meant to be a, a giving critique. It's meant to be something that you share together because you, you know who you are, you know who he is, and you know what it's all about. You know that it's all going to be okay. Judgment's not meant to be scary. Um, the word judgment in Greek has about 20 different meanings, um, but they all kind of show what God's intent was. Um, the act of judging means to separate the good from the bad. Horrible way of putting it, but good from the bad. God separates his believers from those who don't believe in him. And he chooses, he chooses to believe and, and, and be with his believers. He approves of their heart and he determines their righteousness. And he allows them to rule with him. 
the word judgment means all of that, which is crazy that it can mean that much, but that's how it is. Much like how the rapture is meant to end our physical bodies, judgment allows us a way to understand our new eternal life. It allows us that kind of open door, that open gate to like completely live like that. Um, <clears throat> with judgment comes the mark. Dun, dun, dun. Um, first, it's important to understand that the mark isn't going to be an issue for people that believe, like true believers. It's not going to be an issue. John very clearly kind of writes it in Revelation that it's meant to be um, just a reminder or like a warning, like, hey, just so you know, this is going to happen. You don't have to worry about it. It's never meant to be something scary. Secondly, um, it's important that we kind of think about symbolism of that kind of thing also prior to Revelation um, and what was happening beforehand. So right before the mark is mentioned, uh, there's an angel that's proclaiming an eternal gospel. There is an angel that is proclaiming that Babylon is officially fallen. And then there's an angel that warns about the mark. The mark is supposed to be on the forehead or the hand. When you look at the forehead, it generally denotes a belief in something like walking in agreement with something. And the hand denotes um, like a power or authority. So if someone takes this mark from a false god, they're showing that they never had the, the faith and agreement in Jesus and that they can find their power and authority from something else. We as believers are never going to have that issue. We know who he is and what he's about, and that's what matters. Um, to me, I've never seen the mark as a physical mark. I see it as a spiritual mark. You look at what Paul was talking about in Romans um, about circumcision. It's something I talk about with the Ugandans all the time, is that circumcision, yes, it was a physical act. We don't need to talk about that, but spiritually what it's meant to do is it's meant to expose your heart and then purify it so what paul is trying to express is that you know you can't be physically you can be physically circumcised according to the law but you have to be spiritually circumcised you know to um, be transformed and be renewed this spiritual circumcision um, is very similar to the mark i believe that it's meant to be an internal mark that's on our hearts god knows our hearts if we love god we have the mark of him. And that's the only mark that matters. If we don't love God, our heart's going to look a little bit different. And that's, I think, really what it's meant to be. It could be a physical mark. It really could. But to me, within the Bible, that's what makes the most sense. And it's the most logical thing. But who knows? Who knows? Uh, lastly, uh, new heavens and new earth. This was really neat because I don't know anybody that really ever talks about new heavens and new earth. And it's, it's really, it's exciting. Um, but it doesn't mean like when you hear new heavens and new earth, you hear like, oh, you know, God's going to destroy the earth. He's going to destroy the heavens. No. Why would a God who puts so much care into a people and into a world that he would just suddenly be like, no, nah, I'm good. Let's restart. Like that denotes that he made a mistake. That means that something along the way, something went wrong and he wants to rectify it. New heavens and new earth is a renewal. It's always meant to be a renewal. You know, you kind of think about, um, there's a movie, I can't remember what I'm thinking of right now. It might be Chronicles of Narnia where, you know, it's like the winter and then all of a sudden it just gets warm and all the flowers are blooming. You know, it's just like this this like wave, like the Holy Spirit just washing over everything and all these things bloom and all the cats are meowing and all of that. Um, it's meant to be like that. It's never meant to be this really destructive thing. Um, the other word that is used in Revelation is that the new heavens and new earth will pass away. This word pass away means depart. It means like two ships in the night, they're gonna pass right by. We'll never see it happening. It's just gonna happen and it's gonna be beautiful not meant to be scary it's not meant to be like oh no you know i hope he doesn't destroy my favorite forest like no it's just going to be this beautiful renewal this refreshment that's what it's meant to be um for all of this we have to understand that we were made for this it's crazy but we were made for this 
we were made to have this communion with God. We were made to have Eden. That didn't work out. And so he's going to find a way to make it work out. He's going to give us a new Eden after, you know, some trials. <laughs> Not that we have to prove ourselves, but I think it's good for us in order to grow. My mom and I were having a conversation the other day of it's too bad that America is not persecuted more, most countries that they're not persecuted more because in persecution, it makes you realize what you actually believe. It forces you to come to terms with if you actually believe what you believe. And it's the same idea with this. If we truly believe that we're meant to be with God, that we're meant to live this life with him eternally, it means that we're meant to live this life eternally with him. We're meant to be in this renewed, this renewed new heavens, this renewed new earth. We're meant to be with Jesus as he reigns a thousand years. It means that we're meant to go through these tribulations and these, these horrible earthquakes and famines. We're meant to do this because we as a people have the ability to see it as something bigger. It's not just, oh, not another bad thing. We can see it as what is God trying to tell us right now? What is he trying to show us? No other religion ever will ever give you that perspective. And that's what God created us for, was that perspective. It should be noted, though, that, you know, a lot of end time stuff, all of it, could be uh, a lot of it having to do with what happened in Jerusalem. The thing is, though, to believe that it's only talking about what happened in Jerusalem means that um, that God wasn't thinking about the future. It means he just wanted to write that book for the Jewish people at a Jewish time in a Jewish culture. But God's bigger than that. He wrote it for both perspectives. Both things can apply very much. You know, we don't need to argue about, you know, who, who came to destroy it and was that the Antichrist? I don't know. What matters is that God saw the before and the after. He knows the beginning of time and the end of time. And therefore, you know, the Bible is not something that can only be applied to the past. It's also to the future. Um, something kind of cool to end it on. Uh, <laughs> I, I, did, I did write this in my paper. I said, the end is nigh, but not that nigh. I almost changed my title to the end is not that nigh. And then got, got next. But um, we're supposed to have this urgency, this urgency to preach the gospel. You know, it's the Great Commission. We're, we're supposed to have this urgency that Jesus is going to come tomorrow, today, you know, the next day. It's going to happen. It is said in the New Testament, be ready, seven times. Seven is a biblical number for completeness. It means, you know, that this number means that, you know, God created the earth in seven days you know, on the seventh is the seventh day, you know, all of these things have a lot of really intense importance. So we have to realize that being ready is vital in completing God's plan. If we're not ready, and we're not having that yearning to, to, to see what's going to happen, it's not going to work. He'll make it work, but it's not going to work for us. And so part of being ready is not having that fear as Christians, we have absolutely, we can be scared of things for sure. I'm scared of spiders. I'm scared of sharks. We can be scared of things, but as Christians, we should not be scared of death. We should not be scared of judgment. We should not be scared of the end because the end for us is not an end. You know, it, it's, it's a new beginning that was so cheesy, but it's true. It's a new beginning. And, um, you know, when writing this, it just, I, I already wasn't scared of things that will come, but it made me excited. When you look at everything in, in the grand scheme of things, it's exciting. Like I, I hope that I get to live to see the day that Jesus comes down with a, a robe dripped in blood. Like <laughs> I, I hope that happens. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I had a couple people read my paper, uh, to kind of tell me if it all made sense because I always want to make sure that people who know absolutely nothing about this subject can understand it and uh, like what my mom said she said it's excellent food for thought even if you don't agree with it so much of the things that are in the bible it's food for thought it's something that you're going to keep thinking about because spiritually we know that it holds a weight and that it's important even if we don't want to admit it it holds weight 
and things that hold weight need to be addressed. Amen. Would you like to pray for us? I can. I definitely can. Jesus, thank you for um, letting me remember most of my paper. You know, as a fact, I probably forgot half of it. So thank you for the memory jaunt. Um, God, I just pray that anyone that we encounter, I pray that anyone that uh, we're even around constantly, I pray that because of our lives and our lack of fear and our, our, our understanding of how important these things are, that we can teach others that we don't need to be scared, that we don't need to have the fear. We also pray that, you know, with that comes wisdom. We pray that, you know, each encounter that we have with people that we are able to tell them exactly what they need to hear with your absolute truth in it, because without truth, it's just opinion. And we thank you for that. Amen.